Alan Wake 2 is on the horizon, and I thought it would be a good time to go over what we know so far. There are a lot of mysteries and unanswered questions surrounding the events of Alan Wake. In this series, I will go over the story of the game itself, parts of the game of control, as well as the theories and leftover questions that I hope will be answered in the upcoming sequel. Please remember if you enjoy the video to like and subscribe for more and let me know your thoughts down in the comments. Alan Wake was first released in 2010 by Remedy Entertainment, combining elements of mystery and action with a gripping narrative, atmospheric setting, and unique mechanics centered around light and darkness, making it a memorable entry in the psychological thriller genre. The game's story is influenced by the works of authors like Stephen King and TV series like Twin Peaks. Alan Wake explores themes of creativity, the power of the written word, and the thin line between reality and fiction, all set against a backdrop of supernatural terror. It also delves into the psychological struggles of its protagonist as he battles the darkness both externally and within himself. Players control Alan as the narrative unfolds, with each episode revealing more about the story, ancient folklore, personal demons, and a complex web of supernatural events. We begin with Alan telling us a quote by Stephen King. Stephen King once wrote that nightmares exist outside of logic, and there's little fun to be had in explanations. They're antithetical to the poetry of fear. In a horror story, the victim keeps asking why, but there can be no explanation, and there shouldn't be one. The unanswered mystery is what stays with us the longest and it's what we'll remember in the end. This becomes important as the theme of Alan Wake, as there are a lot of unanswered questions and things that we just don't know and maybe aren't meant to understand. Alan's nightmare begins as he enters the fictional town of Night Springs. He is driving too fast and hits a hitchhiker who has suddenly appeared in the road. He gets out and confirms that the man is dead when his vehicle turns off suddenly. The man he hit is gone, and the road behind him is shut by a brick wall. Alan must now head towards the lighthouse on foot. While he makes his way down the road, the hitchhiker reappears, covered in shadows, taunting and criticizing him for feeling as if he is God, having both created and killed in his stories and vowing to take revenge on Alan. Alan runs, crossing a bridge and seeing a man named Clay Stewart, author of the Alan Wake Files. We'll talk more about him later. Clay motions Alan to get to the safety inside of the cabin and is unable to follow Alan as the door slams shut behind him and Clay is killed by the hitchhiker. While Alan watches from inside the cabin, he is attacked by an unknown force and injured. A white light then reveals itself, removing a wall and creating a new path, telling Alan to follow it and seek refuge under the light. The mysterious light then tells us something. I have something important to tell you. It goes like this. For he did not know that beyond the lake he called home lies a deeper, darker ocean green, where waves are both wilder and more serene. To its ports I've been. To its ports, I've been. Do you understand? No. It's okay, Alan. Hopefully we'll understand it later. The light tells Alan the darkness is sleeping and he must show him something important. He says the hitchhiker has been taken by the dark presence and that he can't be hurt because the darkness protects him from harm. And Alan must use light to make him vulnerable. Alan then receives a flashlight and a gun and instructed to deal with the taken shadow. Alan continues to make his way to the lighthouse and now has to run for his life as a dark tornado forms and chases him, hurling objects and demolishing anything in its path. Alan barely makes it to the safety of the lighthouse, slamming the door behind him, and then suddenly, It's 2010, and Alan, a best-selling crime fiction author and his photographer wife, Alice, are traveling on a barge across the water to a small, picturesque town of Bright Falls, Washington. 
The trip for the couple is a much needed break, a chance to get away from all the stress in hopes that Alan will overcome his creative stagnation and rekindle their relationship. Alan had his first story published when he was just 17, and later auditioned to become a writer for a TV series called Night Springs. The script that was submitted described a secret organization called the Federal Bureau of Night Springs. This launched Alan's career, and he then wrote a six-book series around a detective named Alex Casey. Alan is now suffering through a two-year-long writer's block and has been having a rough time. He has yet to create anything since the release of his last success, an Alex Casey novel called The Sudden Stop, in which he killed off the character wanting to break free and create something new. But Alan had been unable to write anything, and this frustration with himself was caught in a cycle of alcohol abuse that has also put a strain on his marriage and caused him to lash out and created problems with the media and run-ins with the law. While on the barge, Alice wants to take the opportunity to get some pictures, and we have a chance to meet one of the other two people on the ship. Pat Main, a local radio host, says that Deerfest is just two weeks away, and that he recognized Alan and hoped for the opportunity to get an interview. Alan denies the interview, saying that he would like to keep him being there a secret, as he was on vacation. The other person on the barge we don't get a chance to talk to, but he is important, so don't forget about him. Anyways, Barry Wheeler, Alan's manager, calls him to make sure that he isn't having any trouble while he's on vacation. Barry and Alice have a bit of a strained relationship, but both want to see Alan overcome his writer's block. Alice drops off Alan at the Oh Dear Diner to pick up a key for their cabin from Carl Stuckey, a local mechanic. Inside the diner, Alan meets Rose Marigold, a waitress and a big fan of Mr. Wake and his books. She even has a stand of Alan proudly presented at the entrance of the diner. He also meets Rusty, a local park ranger who is enjoying a cup of coffee while waiting for someone to pick up Odin and Tor Anderson. The two brothers are sitting in one of the booths in the back, and Odin asks Alan to play a song on the jukebox for him, while Tor becomes annoyed. Just before walking down a dimly lit hall, Alan is told not to go in there and that he could be hurt in the dark. This is Cynthia Weaver, who folks around town call the Lamp Lady. Alan needs to get the key for the cabin and walks down the dimly lit hall. But before he finds Carl Stuckey, Alan is startled by a woman in a black veil who tells him that Carl Stuckey has taken ill and hands him a key along with directions to reach the cabin and says that she will be by later to make sure that they have settled in and of course, to meet Alan's wife. Alan takes the key and info and reunites with Alice who has just pulled up in front of the diner as they drive away, we see Carl Stuckey hastily stumbling out of the diner with the key he needed to give them. The bird-like cabin is in the middle of Cauldron Lake on a small island called Diver's Isle, a beautiful location surrounded by mountains and trees. Alice notices that the power is off and Alan needs to turn on the generator so that they can turn on the lights before it gets dark. Once inside and settled in, Alice, wanting to try and help, says she has a surprise for Alan and has arranged to have a typewriter and paper put into the cabin. She also tells him about Dr. Emile Hartman, who helps artists overcome challenges and blockages of their creativity. Alan becomes infuriated, lashing out, shouting at Alice and storming out of the cabin. Moments later, the power inside the cabin goes out and Alice screams for help. Alan runs back to the cabin and as he enters, she's gone. The railing overlooking the lake is broken and Alice has fallen into the dark waters of Cauldron Lake. Alan dives into the lake after her and blacks out. He wakes up in his car, wrecked, his phone dead and now stranded in the woods on a dark and foggy night. Alan decides to make his way to the nearest light source, a gas station. 
While traversing through the woods, he comes across some pages of a manuscript that he apparently had written, titled Departure a title he was planning to use on a book he hadn't started yet, or at least he had no memory of writing. But as we read the glowing pages, we can see that they describe a brief scene that may have already happened, is happening, or hasn't happened yet. As he traverses the woods, he comes across a logging camp where Alan finally meets Carl Stuckey the maniacal, axe-wielding man who was completely covered in shadows. He had been taken by the Dark Presence, just like in Alan's nightmare. Alan seeks refuge in a trailer, but his relief is short-lived as Stucky drives a bulldozer into the small building. He jumps out just in time before the building falls over the cliffside. He is then greeted by two more taken loggers, and after using the light and his weapon, the bodies vanish without a trace. At another logging site, Alan faces Carl Stuckey, and after defeating him, his body vanishes just like the others. But he leaves behind a manuscript page that says Stuckey was engulfed by darkness while he was in his garage. Alan eventually makes his way to the empty gas station, left by its owner, Carl Stuckey, and looking trashed as if there had been some kind of fight. Alan notices a sign showing that Deerfest was only one week away. It was at this point he realizes that he has lost an entire week of his memory and had no idea where Alice was. Upon entering the gas station, he sees a TV that shows himself raving like a madman in a room with a typewriter. Alan didn't know this, but this was showing him what happened during his lost week inside the cabin. Once he finds a phone, he calls the local authorities. Sheriff Sarah Breaker arrives and sees Alan with a large head wound as he attempts to explain the situation while leaving out the parts that were definitely unbelievable. He tells the sheriff that his wife is missing and that they were staying at the cabin in the middle of Cauldron Lake and he was out looking for her. This made Sarah very skeptical of Alan because he was in the gas station of the already missing Carl Stuckey. The sheriff tells Alan that there is no island in the middle of Cauldron Lake and there hasn't been since the volcanic eruption in the 1970s. She even takes Alan to the lake, where he confirms that she wasn't lying. Episode 2 in Alan and Alice's apartment in New York. Alan had finished his final book in his Alex Casey series titled Sudden Stop. Alice says that she has finished the cover photos for Alan's new book when the power suddenly goes out. This is where we learn of Alice's fear of the dark. With some candles lit, Alan tells Alice about an old light switch his mother gave him as a child that used to belong to his father, called the Clicker, and that it would turn on a magic light that would vanquish monsters, even those hiding in the shadows. Alan didn't know anything about his father, but because the clicker was passed down from his father, it was special to him and helped him get over his fear of the dark. Back at the present, Sheriff Breaker had brought a confused and distraught Alan to the police station and has him checked by a local doctor. Alan lies about his symptoms and what he had seen for fear of being taken away before finding his wife. He gets cleared by the doctor, who was eager to return to his fishing trip. Alan goes to speak with Sheriff Breaker, who has been kind enough to charge Alan's phone. The sheriff asks what happened, but once again, Alan can't be honest with his answers. Once he turns on his phone, he receives a call and briefly hears Alice's voice. Then he speaks to a man who claims to have his wife. The mysterious voice instructs Alan to go outside and check inside of an old vehicle in the back lot, where he finds Alice's driver's license. The kidnapper says he wants to meet Alan at Lover's Peak, located inside the Elderwood National Park, where he would release Alice in exchange for the completed manuscript of Departure, 
and that he must come alone and not involve the police. Right after he hangs up the phone, he also gets a call from Barry, who says he has arrived in Bright Falls. After Barry had not heard from either Alan or Alice for a whole week, he was concerned and was headed to the sheriff's office. Upon re-entering the police station, we officially meet Dr. Hartman, who was at the police station to apologize for two of his patients, the Anderson brothers, who were disruptive during their recent escape from the Cauldron Lake Lodge. This is also the same Dr. Hartman who wants Alan to stay at his retreat for artists and reveals that he had spoken with Alice and had invited her to Bright Falls. This reminds Alan of his fight with Alice and he punches Dr. Hartman in the face blaming him for his current situation. As Alan is being held back by the sheriff, Barry Wheeler makes his entrance. Hartman didn't care to press charges, and Barry and Alan quickly rush out of the police station. Barry and Alan have been friends since they were kids, so they know each other very well. With Barry being here, Alan finally has a sense of relief, being able to be with a friend Barry is kind of like a light in the darkness for Alan. Barry and Alan head to the visitor center at Elderwood Park and rent a cabin from Rusty, close to Lover's Peak, to make the midnight meeting more manageable. Once at the cabin, Alan tries his best to explain everything that he remembered of the previous night to Barry. But Barry had a hard time believing Alan. Alan was a big skeptic and very critical of people who believed in the supernatural, pseudoscience, or anything that required more faith than proof to believe in. Barry did what he could to be supportive as they waited for nightfall. Barry reminds Alan of how horrible his plan is and that they should call the police or even the FBI. Alan says that the kidnapper would probably kill Alice, and he prepares to venture back into the woods towards Lover's Peak. Barry stays behind and waits inside the cabin. As darkness covers the area, the power goes out, and Alan finds Rusty injured and traumatized from an attack at the visitor center. He says that things happen just like on the page he found, and gives Alan a key, saying that the lights need to be turned back on. But Alan was too late, and the dark presence had taken Rusty. Alan is forced to confront Rusty, and again, just like the others who were taken before him, his corpse vanishes. As he continues traversing the forest, he rides a hanging cart that is attacked by birds and crashes into the next platform. Alan gets up surrounded by others who had been taken and is rescued by a man who hands him some flares to use against the advancing waves. This man is Ben Mott. He is the kidnapper and the same man who was on the barge as we entered Bright Falls. Mott refuses to give Alan his gun, so all he has are the flares and a flashlight, forcing Alan to break the shadow veils and hope that Mott hits them. Mott is a terrible shot. Finally clear of any taken and once at Lover's Peak, Mott says that he knows about the manuscript and that everything is happening just like on the page, and he wants the completed manuscript from Alan, telling him that he will bring about something glorious and terrible once he has proper editorial control. Mott threatens Alan, saying he will harm Alice if he doesn't hand over the pages. Alan lashes out and attacks him, causing them to break the guardrail and land on a hiking path below. Mott drops the handgun, and Alan reaches for it. The kidnapper runs off before Alan has a chance to get a shot at him. Alan once again needs to make his way through the forest and decides to go back to Barry and plan what to do next. Barry has now realized that the nightmare Alan had described was true and calls Alan saying that the cabin is being attacked by birds and that Alan needs to save him. Alan tells Barry to stay hidden and keep the lights on, finding a truck and using it to drive back to the cabin. Barry has barricaded himself inside and the flocks of birds touched by the darkness are assaulting the cabin. After Alan disposes of them, Barry starts to come around with the stuff Alan had been saying 
apologizing for not believing him sooner and for thinking he was having a psychotic episode. The following day, Barry heads into town to try and get more information on the kidnapper and find any information on the island and the cabin that had disappeared. Alan stays behind, trying to write a manuscript so he has something to hand the kidnapper to get Alice back in his two-day deadline he received from another phone call. But when he sits down, he still can't write a word. Barry gets a call from Rose, who says she has found the manuscript pages and asks Barry and Alan to come pick them up from her. Barry didn't know this at the time, but she sounds a bit different. We once again see the mysterious woman in black, this time manipulating Rose. Alan and Barry make it to the trailer park where Rose lives and are guided by Randolph. As they walk towards Rose's trailer, Barry says that he found a bunch of information and scary things that happened in Bright Falls, most of which is centered around Cauldron Lake. Randolph tells Barry that the Indians from the area thought that the Cauldron Lake was a doorway to the underworld. Barry also tells Alan that he got a bunch of information from the writings of Cynthia Weaver, the town lamplady, which followed two people in particular, Barbara Jagger, a local legend who drowned, and Thomas Zane, a famous poet who lived in the area. But when he looked him up, he couldn't find any of his works. When Alan and Barry finally meet up with Rose, she invites them in and offers them coffee. Rose seems in a daze, and by the time Alan and Barry start asking questions, they pass out. Alan dreams of a meeting with Thomas Zane, who warns that the dark presence is coming and wearing his barbarous skin, and that he is too weak to stop it, and Alan must turn on the lights. Alan is then taunted by the woman in black, Barbara Jagger, who wants him to finish the manuscript he started. When Alan wakes up, he sees himself on the TV speaking about his editor, Barbara Jagger, who revised his manuscript during the writing process. It's also pretty obvious that Rose is a very big fan of Alan Wake. As Alan makes his way outside, we find that Randolph had called the police out of concern for Rose, and FBI agent Nightingale along with the Bright Falls Police Department have arrived. Alan didn't want to miss his deadline with the kidnapper and runs. Agent Nightingale recklessly shoots at Wake as he retreats and goes into the forest fleeing the area. The dark presence creates a tornado that follows Alan, causing destruction and wreaking havoc on Bright Falls and the police who were chasing him. Continuing to run from police, Alan eventually sees a radio tower and decides to head that way, hoping to meet Pat Main, the gentleman we met at the beginning of the game and looking to rest at the radio station. Once inside the KBFM studio, Pat Main is on the air and announces Alan's arrival to his audience. It doesn't take long for the police to arrive and Agent Nightingale, who once again fires his weapons at us without warning and is immediately reprimanded by Sheriff Breaker. Alan flees once again, making his way through the woods and eventually reaching a train depot. Alan's phone rings. And when he answers, he hears Alice saying strange things that just don't make sense. And then the phone disconnects. Alan, feeling hopeful now that he has heard his wife's voice, finds a truck on the other side of the train depot. And as the sun rises, he drives to the coal mine to meet with the kidnapper as he was instructed. Alan was supposed to meet with the kidnapper at noon in the main building, which is now a museum. Alan waits all day for the kidnapper, who never shows, and instead receives another phone call after nightfall, instructing him to go to Lookout Point at Mirror Peak, a location that overlooks Cauldron Lake. Left with no other option to save his wife, Alan leaves and heads towards the new meeting location. After another long and exhausting trek, Alan finally makes it to Mirror Peak, 
where he hears the voice of the kidnapper pleading for forgiveness and begging not to be hurt. Mott admits that he never actually had Alan's wife and that he had no idea where she was. Maybe she had drowned. As Alan approaches, he catches a glimpse of Barbara Jagger as Mott is pulled into the shadows of the dark presence. Alan quickly grabs a flare, lighting it as he is thrown into Cauldron Lake. A hand reaches into the water, bringing Alan back to the surface. He wakes up later at Dr. Hartman's lodge. Dr. Hartman has Alan heavily medicated and attempts to convince him that he is a patient of the lodge and suffering from a psychotic break after his wife had drowned. This caused him to conjure imaginary supernatural events and created a false reality to cope with the loss. Dr. Hartman then takes Alan on a tour of the lodge, his special retreat for artists suffering mental health issues, so they have somewhere to heal and the help they need while he can monitor them. Dr. Hartman formally introduces Alan to the Anderson brothers, saying they are suffering from advanced stages of dementia from their heavy metal band days. Odin and Tor, who both call Alan Tom, tell him that he should go to their farm, Valhalla, where they too had once battled against the Dark Presence and find the message. The message was a crash course to get their head right. The Anderson brothers knew that the Dark Presence could cause memory loss, and knowing this, the brothers created a song which was meant to be a quick rundown for anyone who might be facing the Dark Presence in the future. When Alan goes back to his room, he sits down and tries to write, but still no success. As it gets dark, the power goes out. A large storm is on its way and a commotion can be heard downstairs. The Anderson brothers had hit a nurse with a hammer and were attempting to make their escape once again and encouraged Alan to do the same. Alan seizes the opportunity, taking a key from an unconscious orderly and heading to the restricted area to retrieve his belongings. Alan finds a photo of the lodge and staff, which included Ben Mott, who had actually been working for Dr. Hartman the whole time. Hartman had Mott track Alan and Alice since they had arrived in Bright Falls, all the way from the beginning of the game on the barge. Alan also learns Alice had a series of informal sessions with Dr. Hartman over the phone, where she told him of her concern for Alan, including his alcohol abuse, violent tendencies, and personal details regarding their relationship. It was at this point that Dr. Hartman extended the invitation to Alice to come to Bright Falls and Alice decided to arrange the trip. Alan finds Barry in one of the back rooms. Barry explains that Hartman and his goons had him locked in the room after he came looking for Alan. Barry also reveals that he had stolen Rose's prized Alan Wake cutout in revenge for giving them false information about the manuscript pages. Barry didn't understand that Rose had been under the control of the Dark Presence when they went to see her. As the two attempt to exit, Hartman reveals himself. Dr. Hartman knew that Alan had interacted with the Dark Presence and that Alan's manuscript was already having an effect on reality. He says that he wanted to try and get Alan to create something beautiful, basically coaching Alan the same way he did Thomas Zane. Alan becomes furious, and as the Dark Presence attacks the Lodge, Alan locks Hartman in an office, alone with the darkness. But sadly, that's not the last we see of him. Dr. Hartman would escape the clinic and be confronted by a taken Ben Mott who wanted revenge. Hartman would sacrifice one of his patients to distract Mott so he could get away, and then have two officers help him defeat Mott when he lures him outside of the lodge. Alan makes his escape into the hedge maze and rejoins Barry at the front of the lodge and they drive away. Alan and Barry begin to figure out what is going on and the mysterious dark force that they are dealing with is the Dark Presence, which is trapped at the bottom of Cauldron Lake and is trying to use the lake's power to get out. The Dark Presence has grown strong enough to influence the residents of Bright Falls to attack Alan. The two make their way to the Anderson's farm, Valhalla, but get separated when they get into an accident in the forest. Once again, Alan must traverse a dark forest in the night, 
but meets back up with Barry at the farm and makes it to the outdoor stage. The Andersons were both part of a band called the Old Gods of Asgard, a popular rock band, and they had built a stage on their property to perform some of their more outlandish shows. The stage was fitted with tons of pyrotechnics and had plenty of weapons, ammos, and batteries. After a long fight of waves have taken, they finally make their way into the house and find the message the brothers told them about. The message was a song titled The Poet and the Muse, inspired by Thomas Zane and Barbara Jagger. The lyrics we hear say to seek the Lady of the Light. Alan recognizes this as Cynthia Weaver, the lamp lady who he had met previously at the Odeer Diner. The two decide to stay the night and get drunk on the special Anderson moonshine. Alan and Barry didn't know it at the time, but the moonshine had a special ingredient, water from Cauldron Lake. Alan dreams of himself from the week before, the time he had lost while in the dark place. The dark presence had used its power to raise the sunken cabin, and after Alan had learned about the typewriter placed inside, he became furious and stormed out. When the power goes out, Alice screams for help, having seen the woman in black who takes her into the dark waters. Alan runs back inside and realizes that Alice had possibly fallen from the balcony and dives in after her. He comes back up from the water, distraught and confused, unable to find Alice and is greeted by the dark presence in the form of Barbara Jagger. She then leads him back into the cabin and tells Alan that Alice had died and he needed to use the typewriter to make things right. Alan listened and began writing departure. The Dark Presence would guide him to create a story to set itself free while making itself stronger. During his week of writing, Alan began to realize what was happening. He learned how the Dark Place worked, and how his writing could affect reality. He also found a shoebox with the books of Thomasine's poems. He learned about Thomasine and realized that if he wanted to save Alice, he would need to write himself into the story as the hero, and using elements of Zane's work, he moved farther away from what the Dark Presence wanted and turned the book into more of a horror story. Alan was beginning to understand that with the reality-bending powers of the lake, the dangers and risk of failure needed to be present. The story needed to be written in a way that made it seem like the hero might not survive. Everything had to make sense, and the story had to connect with the real world. Every action and motivation of the characters needed to be believable. The collaboration with Thomas Zane helped Alan break free from the dark presence, and he was able to get out of the cabin and escape. Alan was able to make it to his car and later crash, where we would then start our adventure. By now, if it isn't apparent, the pages of the manuscript that have been found in the game were written during Alan's week in the dark place and Thomas Zane had scattered those pages around Bright Falls in an effort to help Alan and also keep the dark presence, well, in the dark. Alan and Barry are woken by former Agent Nightingale and Sheriff Breaker, who arrest them and bring them back to the Bright Falls Police Department. Once Alan and Barry wake up from their drunken stupor, they are confronted by Nightingale and Sheriff Breaker, but Alan begins to have visions and breaks down in pain. Sheriff Breaker becomes concerned, but Nightingale isn't buying it and thinks it's a trick. Breaker stands her ground and tells Nightingale that she knew he wasn't there on official business. Nightingale realizes what is happening is written on a manuscript page he has found. But before he's able to react, he's swept away by the dark presence. Sheriff Sarah Breaker, Alan, and Barry then run in search of safety in the light. The sheriff was a longtime resident of Bright Falls and was already familiar with some of the strange occurrences that can happen in the area. She takes Alan to his things, asking what she needs to know. With a quick review and saying that he needs to find Cynthia Weaver, Sarah says that it would be easier to get where Cynthia lives in the old power plant by helicopter. She then tells Barry to stay in the station and gives him a list of people to call with the code phrase, Night Springs. At the very top of the list is Sarah Breaker's father, Frank Breaker. 
Frank Breaker is a not-so-simple apple farmer. He's a retired police officer from New York City who also worked for the Federal Bureau of Control, a branch of the U.S. federal government that focuses on all things supernatural. Frank Breaker had seen all sorts of things during his time with the FBC and knew he needed to be ready for anything. He calls a former colleague, William Kirkland, who at this time was the head of investigations at the FBC and began to coordinate with local law enforcement to address the turmoil being caused by the dark presence. And while Barry stays at the station, continuing to make calls, warning others of the strange events, Sarah and Alan make their way through town. Barry eventually finds his way to Sarah and Alan, this time donning a fashionable set of Christmas lights, a headlamp, and wielding a flare gun. Finally making it to the helicopter and after fighting waves of Taken, the group heads towards the power plant. Sarah makes an attempt to touch down, but the helicopter is attacked by birds and they are forced to leave Alan, only able to provide momentary periods of light to help protect him from the darkness. Alan eventually makes it to the power plant and meets Cynthia Weaver, our Lady of Light, who of course yells at Alan for taking so long to get there. Cynthia Weaver was a longtime resident of Bright Falls and was a bit of a local historian. She had been close to Thomas Zane and had an unreciprocated crush on him. She knows all about the dark presence and how dangerous it is. She says that Thomas Zane had kept in touch with her all these years and entrusted her with the shoebox that contained a failsafe for when the dark presence returned. She dedicated herself to keeping that shoebox safe, storing it in part of an old decommissioned military base in a place she called the well-lit room and she would guide Alan to it. Sarah and Barry crash the helicopter and Alan becomes concerned, wanting to go check on them, emphasizing that Barry is his best friend. Cynthia reminds Alan that he must make it to the well-lit room and the two separate as Cynthia refuses to travel anywhere that does not have light. Alan catches up with Barry and Sarah who were thankfully okay, but overwhelmed by Taken. Alan shows up just in time and the team makes their way to the dam to catch up with Cynthia to go to the well-lit room. Inside the room with hundreds of lights that Cynthia had made sure to change regularly is an old shoebox with an antique switch, the clicker, along with one final piece of Thomas Zane's writing. The story from Alan's childhood the same story that Alan had told Alice about the clicker being given to him by his mother. Alan knows that this is the clicker from his childhood, the one he had given to Alice. But this page was written by Thomas Zane. Somehow, it's here in this shoebox. But with this, he has what he needs to save Alice. We begin with another flashback from two years ago. Alan is waking up with a massive hangover. He takes some painkillers and locates some sunglasses to ease the consequences of his decision, while saying that in a brief moment of self-deception, he had sworn to quit drinking. Alan comes across a message on the answering machine from Barry, telling Alan to leave Alice. Afterwards, he turns on the TV to watch himself on a talk show where he talks about his new book. Alice comes home and Alan becomes very confrontational with her saying the stress is getting to him and then the two plan to go on vacation shortly after this. Back to the present day, Alan figures that he needs to head back to the cabin so that he can complete departure and that he will be able to fix everything if he does. Alan says that he has to finish this story on his own, leaving Cynthia Weaver, Sheriff Sarah Breaker, and his friend Barry Wheeler behind none of them sure if they will ever see Alan again as he heads to Cauldron Lake with the clicker in hand. The Dark Presence knows that Alan has the clicker and is working even harder to destroy him now, spreading its influence to anyone it can find. Alan makes his way through the forest, this time to face the Dark Presence itself. The tornado proves difficult, and as Alan uses his light to defeat it, it retreats into the water. Alan jumps into Cauldron Lake, the clicker still in his hand. Suddenly, he wakes up in bed with Alice, 
or a poor representation of her. It's the dark presence attempting to trick Alan, currently in his old apartment in New York City. Alan knew this was an illusion made by the dark presence, but with Zane's guidance, Alan is able to break the illusion and is reminded he must forge a path to the cabin. This is also where we are first introduced to Mr. Scratch, being told that Alan's friends will meet him while Alan is gone. With the illusion broken, Alan can now use light to illuminate words, bringing his words to life, aiding him in maneuvering around the dark place. Alan reveals a path forward, confronting the dark presence as Barbara Jagger, who tells him that it will find a new host if needed and can do it easily. But Alan was determined to save Alice and shoves the clicker into the hole where her heart once was and pressed it in, enveloping Barbara Jagger's body with light and destroying the vessel the Dark Presence had used for so long. Alan goes upstairs and sits down in front of the typewriter to write his ending to departure. Alan had sacrificed himself for his wife to be let go. Alice emerges back into reality and then swims to the pier, confused and alone, but finally safe. As the week comes to a close, Deerfest has finally come to Bright Falls. We see residents celebrating, no longer tormented by Alan's story, but Rose remembers the touch of the dark presence and is suffering the consequences, clutching a lamp and keeping light close and behind her in the shadows, Nightingale. We get one last glimpse of Alan. It's not a lake. It's an ocean. The famous line that we hope will be clarified in Alan Wake 2, but some believe that it is a reference to the poem Zane told Alan at the beginning of the game. With the beginning of the DLC, we have to acknowledge that at this point, Alan Wake has been alone for a while, and studies have shown that prolonged periods of solitary confinement can lead to physiological and psychological issues, such as severe anxiety, paranoia, cognitive degeneration, as well as visual and auditory hallucinations. While Alan is in the dark place, we watch his psyche break down, his hallucinations manifest into this reality and have real consequences. Alan finds himself in a surreal version of Bright Falls, somehow arriving at the Oh Dear Diner. Everything cloaked in shadows and voices have a demonic undertone. Making his way to the back of the diner, he goes into a bathroom and talks to Thomas Zane through a mirror once again providing Alan with weapons and telling him not to fall deeper into the illusion. Alan finds a manuscript page and words begin to appear before him. Once again, he must illuminate the words to create items or events to help guide himself through the dark place. Alan receives a phone and Thomas Zane tells Alan to follow the signal to navigate through the dark place. Otherwise, he will slip deeper Alan eventually encounters a dark place version of Barry, who then joins him after activating the word friend. Eventually, Alan ends up in his apartment. Thomas Zane appears once again to tell Alan that he is doing this to himself and that his mind is altering these places and creating these manifestations. Alan encounters TVs displaying a disturbed version of himself and then calls upon the dark place to conjure forces to attack him. Alan destroys the TVs, but remains in the dark place. After defeating the screens, the insane version of himself begins to scream. Alan passes out and wakes up in Dr. Hartman's clinic. Dr. Hartman extending a hand to Alan, telling him that it's all in his head and that he's making it up. Alan comes to the realization, as he is surrounded by manuscript pages, the pointlessness of what he is doing, and that he is truly trapped in the dark place becoming enveloped in fear that he will never escape. The writer DLC picks up right after the signal, as Alan is still trying to find a way out of the dark place. Dr. Hartman now is starting to look a little bit more like Barry, 
and Barry is trying to remind Alan that reality is different here. Barry tells him that everything is complicated here, even his own memories, and says that he needs to speak with Thomas Zane, choosing not to follow Alan because he knows that he is imaginary and the non-imaginary people should talk. Alan makes his way through and eventually speaks with Thomas Zane again, who tells Alan that he must wake up as he is trapped in his own dream. But first, he must be reunited with himself. He must return to the cabin. Alan continues to encounter psychotic versions of himself through TV screens that would alter the reality around him. The broken version of himself within the cabin still has control over the dark place. Thomas Zane gives Alan a manuscript page that allows him to move forward and continue to his destination, reminding him that his words still have power here. Thomas Zane tells Alan that the dark place is home to stronger entities than he can imagine, and that he doesn't know how to get Alan out of the dark place, or what happened to the dark presence after their battle. Zane tells Alan that he has split himself in two, one representing his awareness of what is happening now, determined and refusing to give up, and the other is in a fit of insanity. The Alan the player is in control of is the rational part, and our goal is to get him back in control before insanity takes over. Alan then questions Zane about Mr. Scratch, who Zane says is not Alan, but is the Alan that was made to fit the story. Zane then reminds Alan that he is not the author of his story. As Alan continues to traverse the dark place, we begin to see twisted versions of Alan's imagination, one being a fake conversation between Dr. Hartman and a deranged version of himself represented as a TV head. We even hear a conversation where Alice speaks of hatred for Alan, but none of this is real. It never happened. This is a result of Alan's psychosis coming into reality. Alan arrives at the cabin where he is forced to fight off an illusion of Barry. Barry begins to try and stop us. He is upset and disappointed in Alan that he would try and expel this dream world. He tells Alan negative remarks and things that amplify Alan's insecurities. But once Alan defeats him, we are able to enter the cabin. Alan finds the irrational version of himself on the floor, repeating how he can't find his way, that it's so dark and he doesn't understand why this is happening to him. Once Alan touches his other self, they merge, and he realizes that the irrational self was born out of fear of not being able to escape. He was thinking clearly, finally gaining control. Regaining sanity, he can't afford to make that mistake again. If he slips out of reality, he could be gone forever. He finally has new clarity, a new goal, and sits down in front of the typewriter. Looking forward, Alan begins work on a sequel to Departure, a new manuscript called Return, in an attempt to influence his escape. Hopefully, we'll find out if that works in Alan Wake 2. There's a lot of questions that are still left over from the game and its DLCs. For 13 years, Alan has attempted to right his way out of the dark place. Hopefully, he is able to make it out. And hopefully, we get some answers to all of the outlying questions in Alan Wake 2. I hope this summary helps prepare you for the upcoming sequel, and I would love to hear your thoughts and theories in the comments. I'll see you next time.